Hello everyone. Back again with film recaps. In this video, I will recap one of the thriller films from 2010, titled The Torture. Before we get to the storyline, I'd like to wish everyone a happy and great day. Without further ado, let's get straight to the storyline. The film begins by showing the life of a small family, that looks like they are having a good time together. The husband named Craig is a doctor, and his wife, Elise, works as an agent in the real estate industry. Since their daily schedules are different, Craig and Elise have to divide tasks in turn, to look after their six-year-old beloved son named Benjamin. On that morning Elise has to go to work as usual, while Craig is doing his turn to take care of Benjamin. After his wife has left the house, Craig invites Benjamin to play ball with him in the yard. But after noticing the weather begins to get hot that morning, Craig goes back into the house first and get the sun protection lotion for Benjamin. Unfortunately, he is completely unaware that a man in a car parked not far from his yard, has been keeping an eye on Benjamin. When Craig gets inside, the car slowly begins to move closer to the yard, and is now only a few meters away from where Benjamin is playing. While inside the house, Craig looks confused as he looks for a lotion among his wife's messy set of cosmetics in a drawer. He has no idea that he is about to go through the worst experience of his life. Since Craig is unable to keep up with the car's speed, he immediately takes out his car and begins chasing after the kidnapper. During his panicking, Craig encounters yet another setback, just as he is about to call the police, it turns out that his cell phone was left in the house. In Craig's mind, there is only one thing that he should do at this point, which is to pursue and locate the kidnapper's vehicle on his own. He then comes to a stop at an overpass, but unfortunately again, the kidnapper's car has now vanished from his sight. Traffic conditions also becomes chaotic, as Craig tries to stop each car one by one to borrow a cell phone. 911, what's your emergency? Someone's kidnapped my son. Elise, who has just returned home from work, is of course surprised when she finds her house has been crowded with police officers, as well as several reporters. When Elise enters the house, she meets her husband with a panicked expression, as if she is about to ask him a question but no words are spoken. A detective tries to get Elise to sit down first, and talk about her child kidnapping. However, this only makes Elise even more panicked, as she screams hysterically asking where her child is. Several hours have passed, the police still haven't received any information regarding the motive for the kidnapping. Elise begins to wonder why the kidnapper hasn't contacted them, to demand a ransom payment yet. At this point, she starts to assume that Benjamin was kidnapped not for money, but rather because of the behavior of someone who takes pleasure in the activity, or generally referred to as a psychopath. My little boy's name is Benjamin Michael Landry. Whoever has my little boy, please don't hurt him. Please. Meanwhile, Benjamin who has been placed in a basement room, screams in fear while calling for his father and mother. Benjamin's scream makes the psycho man named John Kozlowski feels annoyed. Shut up! As a result, John who is irritated by the noise, enters the room and intends to kill Benjamin. You're in real trouble. Stop, don't come near me! This is a messy room. I'm telling you, I am very, very angry. Later in the day, two police officers named Patterson and Alvarez come to John's house, after receiving several reports from the local community. Some of the residents have reported hearing the sound of crying coming from John's basement. At this moment, John opens the door to his house without letting them in to see what is going on. He then claims that he is depressed at the moment and that is his voice. But Alvarez who is dissatisfied with John's response tries to find out whether John has children or not. John then responds that he doesn't have any children, and he just lives alone in that house. At this point, Alvarez actually notices that there are children's clothes inside the house, and they believe that John is hiding something. The two of them who are now suspicious ask for permission to go inside, and check out the house, but John refuses the request. Instead, he again asks the two policemen to show warrants first. As a result, the two police officers are compelled to take more drastic measures against him. 
It takes them a while to explore the house room by room, until Patterson discovers an access door that leads to the basement. Upon entering the basement room, he only discovers old furniture that is worn and dirty. But the policeman is still firmly believes that something is wrong in the house. He also finds blood stains along with jumbled tools such as drills, screwdrivers and hammer that have been covered in blood. When Patterson opens the door to another room, he is taken aback by the sight of Benjamin's lifeless body. Following that, Elise hears the sound of the phone ringing and forces herself to pick it up. It is unfortunate for her to hear the news that Benjamin has been found dead, and Elise as a mother can no longer says a word, until her body falls weakly. As they make their way to the hospital, she and her husband are still hoping that the child is not Benjamin. But in reality once Craig and Elise arrive at the hospital, they are forced to accept that the boy is really Benjamin. In just a matter of hours, their once happy life is turned upside down. Craig and Elise who are still depressed and frustrated, attempt to seek justice so that the psychopath is punished as severely as possible for what he has done. But in the end, the court's decision is not as what they had expected, where John is only sentenced to 25 years in prison. Defendant John Kozlowski, two counts murder in the first degree, two counts kidnapping. May it please the court, my client pleads not guilty. He is still trying to determine the amount of victims and their identities. It looks like Craig and Elise are very angry and disappointed after the judge made a decision on their case. Elise can't hold back her emotion and asks Craig to help her get a gun, and Craig explains that killing the culprit won't change anything. Elise then says that they have failed to become a parents and that they have to do something for the dignity of their son. Several days have passed, Craig and Elise's mental state looks very bad. The situation becomes even worse as they start to no longer care about each other. Moreover, they are now often fighting just because they are debating over who should be blamed. In the midst of adversity, Elise finally decides to live Craig for a while to calm herself down. Following his wife's departure, Craig appears to be in a state of desperation, believing that there is no future or hope that can bring their family back together as it once did until he finally decides to take his own life by injecting something into his arm. But when he sees Benjamin's photo right in front of him, he senses a whisper that strengthens his faith, and also his mind not to do that reckless act. It brings him back to a time when the three of them were still together, and he remembers how happy his small family was as they lived together with their beloved child. After that, something emerges to Craig's mind as a way to express his disappointment, which has now turned him into an angry man until a whisper appears again in his heart and soul, initiating a mode of revenge. It is at this point he comes to his wife's place, to bring her in avenging the death of their beloved child. At first, Craig and Elise begin their action by going to the hospital, where Craig is currently working. Craig gets out of the car and makes his way through the several of medical staff. He then comes across an ambulance whose door is not locked. After Craig gets inside the ambulance, he takes some medicine and places it in a small bag. The next day at a prison, John Kozlowski will begin the process of being transferred to another prison that is more heavily guarded. Craig and Elise on the other hand, are sneaking John who is being escorted by the police from a distance, and follows the vehicle to carry out their action. On their way to New Jail, the prisoner transport vehicle stops at a gas station, where one of the police officers enters a convenience store to buy a few cups of coffee. Elise then gets out of the car and enters the convenience store, where they proceed to carry out their plan. Craig then catches up with Elise and causes trouble at the cashier, in order to attract everyone's attention. My change. What change? I give me no change. Give me my the journey then continues again, and they will continue to follow the prisoner vehicle while waiting for the drug to react. Craig as a doctor is so sure that the police officers who take it will experience side effect from the drug. And their plan is successful because in 30 minutes, the prisoner transport vehicle stops in the middle of the road. The police officers quickly get out of the van, as they're experiencing stomach pains. Craig then quickly gets into that vehicle and drives away with the prisoner, while his wife follows close behind him in the car. As they approach the edge of the forest, Craig who is driving at high speed accidentally hits a deer that crossing right in front of him. Oh Are you okay? 
Yeah, I think so. Fortunately, Craig only suffers a slight injury to his face as a result of the accident. They then sees a prisoner who is covered in blood lying on the ground. Therefore, they try to check on John Kozlowski's condition, and discover that he has passed out as a result of the accident. They then immediately take John to a plantation house far away from the city where they live. At first, they place John on a table with his legs and hands still in handcuffs. John then begins to awaken again, and at that moment Craig tells him that he will be given a medicine. This explains that the drugs taken by Craig in the ambulance before, is part of his main plan. It is likely that they will begin torturing John and will not allow him to die, by letting the drug to keep John awake for several weeks. The next morning, when they are cleaning the car of bloodstains, Elise suddenly gets a phone call from Detective Berger. The detective informs that the prisoner transport that was used to move John has just had an accident, and John had managed to escape. When Elise hears this, she pretends to be surprised by the information even though they are the mastermind behind the incident. The detective also expresses regret for the negligence of the police officers. In the middle of the night, Craig's mind seems to be haunted by the loss of his son, with memories of Benjamin keep flashing through his mind. As a result, the feeling of loss prompts Craig to vent his anger again by coming to John, and places his smoldering cigarette in John's stomach until he feels excruciating pain. The torture resumes the following morning, with Craig soldering last night's cigarette burns in John's stomach. At this moment, Elise who hears John's screams of pain, begins to feel bad for what they have done to him. But Craig tries to persuade Elise by saying that what they are doing now is not commensurate with what he had done to their child. After saying that, Craig who appears to be unsatisfied, resumes his actions by injecting something into John's neck. It turns out that the drug will cause John to experience cramping in his muscles. But it won't be a single muscle cramp like when we're swimming, instead, it'll be a cramp that affects every muscle in the body. The following morning, as they are tormenting John in the basement again, they are startled by the sound of footsteps on the plank floor above their heads. It turns out that a man with his dog have entered the house, and the man is a resident of the surrounding area. Suspecting of what Elise is doing in the house, the man informs Elise that the house belongs to a man named Frank Joseph. Elise who is a real estate agent, masterfully controls the situation by telling the man that the house is in the process of being sold. Plus, she is an agent who is now waiting for his client to see the condition of the house. Fortunately, the man believes it when Craig pretends as a buyer, and leaves them right away. Meanwhile, Detective Berger is informed by one of the police officers, that the prisoner transport vehicle has now been found. The detective immediately rushes to the scene of the accident, to find out what has exactly happened. Craig and Elise who are torturing John again are taken aback, as John says that he doesn't remember anything other than the previous vehicle accident. He even says that he didn't remember who he really is, which might be due to the pounding in his head during the accident. Elise keeps trying not to believe what John is telling them. However, they both begin to feel guilty for torturing the man who has no idea why he is being tortured. But Elise is still not willing to let him go, because she is sure that he is just lying. They then try a way to prove that the man is lying, by hurting John's leg and forcing the man to say their son's name. I know you're lying. What was my son's name? Come on, that's nothing. That didn't hurt. This is nothing. I don't know, lady. Just say his name, I'm not gonna stop. What was my son's name? No, stop, please. Say his name. Benjamin! His name is Benjamin! Still believe he doesn't remember. Later that night, Elise wakes up from her sleep and goes to the toilet. Meanwhile in the basement, John who has been handcuffed is attempting to free himself. With a little effort, he finally manages to break free, and the handcuffs that bind his legs and hands are released. After that, he goes upstairs in order to get out, but Elise who is sitting on the toilet is startled by the sound of the bedroom door slowly opening. She is panicked and scared but all she can do is look at her husband who is still sleeping. At this point, she has no other choice but to try to attack the man behind the toilet. Elise moves slowly while holding an iron pipe in her hands, and knocks John unconscious. Craig is startled awake and they quickly take the man back into the basement. 
Unfortunately, the man suddenly awakens again and fights them off by kicking Craig down the stairs. But he doesn't attack Elise and instead rushes away from there. We can't let him get away. The police, on the other hand, are conducting a search near the area. Fortunately for them, they are finally managed to find and apprehend John who is trying to escape. It is at this point everything is explained, and of course the man being arrested is John Kozlowski, the one who will be sentenced to 25 years in prison for killing a child. However, the main point is that in the van that was hijacked earlier, there's also another guilty party named Patrick Galligan, who is sentenced to 18 months in prison for tax evasion and fraud. Well, as we can see, this guy is the one who was supposed to spend his days with Craig and Elise in that house. Craig and Elise on the other hand, are shocked to see that the man they are chasing has hanged himself, where they also discover a piece of paper with a message written by the man. The man who turns out to be Patrick Galligan says that he knows he is a very hated person, and expresses his regret for it. Plus, he says that he is deserving of what has been done to him, but he is unable to endure the torture any longer, so he decides to end his life. Craig and Elise who know this, are taken aback by the realization that they have failed in their vengeance, because the man they had tortured all day before is not John Kozlowski, the man who killed their child, but Patrick Galligan. Okay guys, that's all the recap for the torture 2010. Thanks for watching. See you again in the next video.